Welcome to Beyond Barber School. I am your host, Barbara Doza. This podcast, Beyond Barber School, is a space where listeners will hear stories from barbers, educators, and founders that are elevating the barbering industry in and out of the barber shop. Our hope here is to empower barbers with the knowledge necessary to take a courageous next step in their barber journey. Welcome to Beyond Barber School. Today we got Ethan. He's a three location barbershop owner. He's also an entrepreneur on IG. You know him as Life of Savant. A little context here. We met in the fall 2021 at the Salt Lake City Beauty and Barber Expo. Shout out to Jay Majors. Jay Majors is uh, the one who introduced us. Actually, Jay was like, yo, you have to go talk to this guy and his co-owner. And man, I'm so glad he introduced us because that was such a good conversation. I was like hype. Like I could tell right away. I was like, this Ethan don't play games like this. He he is not playing games. This is serious. This is a serious entrepreneur. And so, yeah, man, you just opened up your third. I think at the time when we met, you were like, I'm opening up a third location soon. And now you finally opened it up. So let's start with that. You opened up. You just opened up your third location. Like I mean, it's crazy with like supply chain and stuff, I'm sure. But what was it like opening up the third one, like versus opening up like the first and second? Like talk to us a little bit about that. So for the third one, you're completely right about like the supply chain issues. But like the goal was, so we started the first one back in 2017 and my business partner, Marcus, went and opened the second location like mid COVID before the supply chains started like going everywhere. Mm -hmm. So we were like, all right, it's time for the third one. And we found a good location up in Bountiful, Utah. And the hardest, the whole construction process was easy other than like getting bids Mm -hmm. because people are so busy here right now because of all the construction. Cause we have like something like 40,000 people moving here a month right now. So like, like the, they're like, okay, you, you talk to a electrician and he'll walk in and I, I needed eight outlets and a new, and a new electrical panel. Right. And he came in, the first guy was like 15 G's right off rip. Don't care. Bink didn't even like actually do math and was like, I'm so busy. You can either pay 15 G's or I'm walking away. Wow. And we were like, okay, much respect, not to be rude. You can walk away. Right. (laughs) And Right. So like with contractors, it was a little bit crazy, but then it came to like, we, we, uh, basically get most of our stuff custom manufactured sure. direct from a manufacturer. Cause it cuts out costs like barber chairs, mm-hmm. um, stations, anything we really want. Right. So we ordered these stations back in July when we signed the lease in 2021. Okay. They didn't get here until January 3rd. And they got to the port in LA on November 2nd and just sat on the boat. Yeah, just sitting there. Like, and I'm calling because I I'm like, did they get seized? Did, yeah. Like it doesn't make sense. So like with opening this new location, it was more than like worth it. But like literally the thing I learned from that experience is if you plan on opening a barbershop and getting like a bulk order of stuff right now. Mm-hmm. order it before you even sign a lease just put it in a storage unit it'll cost you less to pay two hundred dollars a month for a storage unit than it cost me to pay for two months worth of rent on a space i couldn't even use because the stations yeah. weren't there yeah because i remember looking at pictures and yeah it was just like always you were like just waiting on these stations like just waiting on these stations because it was like everything else was done and you were legit you couldn't have barbers in there yet like that's crazy yeah like well it got to the point where we were like are we gonna go buy mirrors and just waste a thousand dollars just to open. Wow. Like the stations came out fire, but Oh yeah, it looked great. It was a little it was a little stressful. But now what's good is we've been we've been getting into the community doing a lot of marketing and like yeah. on average, not even a month yet, and we're averaging six new clients a day. Oh wow. On okay. top of like people coming back. Like yeah. and a lot of that I would attribute to like social media marketing. Like in all reality, but then there's, there's other ways we market to that help yeah. like diverse clientele. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the name, right? So Savant, I remember 
I remember you guys were repping the shirt that you guys had made at the expo, and I just thought the name was dope. So can you tell us even about how you guys came up with the name Savant, just the the, the brand? Yeah, what, is, what does Savant mean, and why'd you pick it? So when I was younger, my dad explained the word Savant to me, right? And it, the definition of the word Savant is a learned scholar or distinguished scientist. And our brand is about we don't hire anybody unless they want to be the best or they are the best. So you better be a learned scholar or distinguished scientist to be around us. And on top of that, we want our clientele to feel like they're savants too. So mm-hmm. when they come in, whether they're a young kid playing football or they're doing all that, like we have people on our team who are D1 championship athletes that got injured and now they're barbers, but they can provide advice to those kids to keep them out of trouble or help them get to their goals. And then like on top of that, like I think on our team, we have at least three national educators. Oh, wow. So like we know what we're doing. We know the quality we want and we want people to understand that this is a science. It's an art form, but it's a science. Like the way you get booked, maintain a clientele and are able to do really hard haircuts every day is a science. It's not. It's not just art. You can be creative after you've mastered the science. I mean, people are probably already getting a taste. Like, like I said, you don't play games. Like, this is this. You're a businessman. Like, you're an yeah. entrepreneur. Like, and you you understand these principles and whatnot. So, I mean, I, I watched the the YouTube video where you share a little bit more about your background and then how you got into barbering. I think each of the co-founders of of Savant talk a little bit about their story. It seemed that you were hustling and then had to pivot, you know, to find another platform or career to continue hustling. Can you just talk to us a little bit about how you even got into barbering? So full honesty, I was like a little hoodlum kid that would like sell weed. I kept getting in trouble. Like I think by the time I stopped like and got out of the game, because back then it wasn't like right now where like the majority of the estates it's legal or you might get like a tobacco ticket for weed or like you're fine. Right. So like I was, I was like, pushing weight and I ended up getting caught in Nephi County in Utah Mm -hmm. and I had one felony because I was working construction at the time like on my that I was going to be charged with I had one felony pending because one of my co-workers had dropped an Adderall under my seat and I was making drives from here to LA to pick up like packs sure to sell them back here for more okay and I got pulled over on my way back so I had like two felonies pending and I had, I had some misdemeanors and I had to go to court. And like, at, like once I like, once it kicked into me that like, Oh, this is serious. I was like, okay, what is something else? That's like pretty similar. Like, Mm. cause like, you know how people are on a rotation with like their weed or their, they like, or their food or like, it's always consistent. Right. So I was like, okay, well, I think barbershops are dope. And I had gotten my haircut for the first time at a barbershop in Rancho Cucamonga by a 2% barbershop. All right. Yeah. So, and their shop is lit. Like they did it right. The interior design's good. They have good barbers. And I was talking to this cat and I'm sad I don't have him on Instagram or know his name anymore. But he was, he was driving from Bakersfield all the way down to Rancho no every way. day to cut hair. That's wild. And I was like, this boy's driving like three, four hours a day to come cut at this barbershop. What's so special about being a barber, right? Yeah, yeah. So what's, like, what's the value like, here? Like, what is going on, right? So yeah. I was like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to cut hair, but we're going to take selling weed strategies mm-hmm. into cutting hair. And like, Back then, I was like a skinny little 125-pound kid, and I walked into the best barbershop in the state called Joseph's Barbershop, and I was like, I just picked up a broom. I didn't even ask. No I just way. picked up a broom and was like, all right, I'm going to be your apprentice. And he was like, huh? I was like, I'm not going anywhere. I know apprenticeships are legal here. I'm your apprentice, and I don't care. And he's like, okay. what? I was like, and he like asked me to leave like five or six times. I was like, no, I'm sweeping. I'm not leaving. Right. So I finally break him down Hmm. and get him to take me as an apprentice. 
And like at the time, it's like the best barbers in Utah, Mm -hmm. other than like two or three worked at that barbershop. Okay. Mind you, I've never picked up clippers before other than like at my house with a foreguard shaving the side of my head. Right. Never, never even touched clippers. Yeah. Yeah. It's new. Okay. I go spend $1,500. I get a blow dryer. I get some cheap shears and I get a pair of masters and some 76ers. Okay. This man, no trimmer. No trimmer or, oh, whoa. Or oh, I think I got donated uh, some Andis T liners. All right. I all got right. donated. I got donated. So right, cool. they just hand me, I come in with the toe to shit and they're yeah, like, cool, course. go set up. I'm like, huh? They're like, go set up. There's 10 people waiting. Yeah. And I start cutting hair. Wow. And just like, and then no, <laughs> like, Barely any education, don't know how to start, get through, or do a fade. Cutting hair right next to like the best barbers in the state. Like just trying to copy what they're doing and not make the client feel weird, right? Yeah, that's wild actually. Just like thinking like the first three months thinking like, did I really want to do this? Is this worth it? Like, do I, do I like cutting hair? Like, is it, am I even good enough to be doing this? Like, I get you all those thoughts right and then just so real man those are those thoughts are so real starting out oh yeah and then we started flying out going to expos and stuff and we met like everybody at these expos we kind of got like lucky in the fact that the people we met were like the right people to like build more connections and then we start flying out to like all over the place yeah and barber like randomly we went to battle of the barbers in Modesto, California with Vic, right? Okay. Yeah. And we're like, we're like just like 20. Marcus took a trophy and I got a sponsorship that wasn't really a sponsorship, you know? Like they were like, we can't give you full, both first place. So like, here's a trophy and you're sponsored by this company that like sponsored the event. And that was like my first hair sponsorship. Sure. And like, Back then, like the glow of it was so cool. And like knowing what I know now, like I would have had like contracts written up and like. Oh, yeah. Protection. Yeah. Like. (laughs) Have a paper trail. Yeah. Because they were like asking us hair product ideas and then like stole them and then Mm. like used them. I'm not going to name the brand, but you know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) So, so then we start learning a little bit more and like flying around town and we end up flying to like. Connecticut. No, we went to what's what's Barber Connects event. Oh, the Barbercon. Barbercon. We went to the first one ever, and that's like where we started meeting everyone. Because sure. there was like IBS New York. Yep. There was that si- like same weekend it's was in Beach New too. York. Yeah. Yeah. But this was the first one ever, so like they were just feeling it out. So it's. They they threw it in this like three story club. I'm starting to understand what the industry's like outside of like the shop setting. There's a whole and that's, world out there. That's what triggered like everything for me as I was like, oh boy. That's the thing too. I feel like going into shows like I went to a handful of this last year. It's like you can see the vendor list before you show up. You know, like those things are public. So it's kind of like, well, let me take a look and see who's going to be there. Let me go ahead and follow a lot of the vendors before the event even happens. Like, so that follow them, comment on their stuff so that when you're there, yeah, it's like what you said. Like, that's the legwork, you know, Instagram, social media, if they have a YouTube channel, like starting to engage with them prior to the event makes it easier because they're like, oh, you're Barbara Doza. I know who you are. You know, like you commented on my stuff. Or you at least look familiar enough because they've seen you pop up that they're like, do I know you? Yeah. Like, how right. Do I, why do I know you from somewhere? Yeah. And like on top of that. So like what we would do is we would get like the people that were going. Mm-hmm. And back then it wasn't as easy to get like the, the vendors list. No. So we yeah. would we would follow everybody that was like commenting and posting on like the the expos stuff. Yeah. And then we would find one of the small barber brands and offer to showcase at their booth. Because one, it's good marketing for them because you're doing haircuts that draw attention to their Definitely. stuff they're trying to sell. But Definitely. two, it makes you look really good. Like oh, yeah. really good. Because when when someone who's like has a big name 
w- walks up to you and you don't fangirl them and they're talking to you, they always invite you to their booth at the time they're doing it. And when you're able to say, cool, well, I'm at, come to my booth. It like levels that playing field of they're like, oh, you do this too. I get it. So, okay. You're, cause yeah, this is part of like, I mean, you hit the scene, you're showing up to the events, you're paying for the flights. Like you're, I mean, it's an investment that you're doing of time, money, obviously. How much of your success, like, would you attribute to that legwork and networking that you did and showing up to the expos and trade shows and just meeting people? Like, what's the value of that for you? I feel like the value of it for me is probably different than a lot of people's because once I went to like my first one or two expos, I kind of like that shiny, glittery curtain. When you walk in, you're like, this is so cool, was gone. So I started paying attention to like, okay, where's the owner of Squire? Mm. Or where's the owner of Hanzo? Or who's the, or at least who's the head dog here for them? And then I would go build connections with them. And then I'd build connections with their team instead of like fangirling and going and blowing a bunch of money everywhere, which it's good to spend money at expos because usually you can get stuff for a better price anyway. But like I was more there for like, because like I wanted to see the whole thing through of like, okay, so how do you become a national educator? Or how do you get big like like Sophie from Babylis? Like how do you do that? I went in with a different mentality than that. And like that investment is huge because the lessons I learned and the people I got to talk to, even though my following on Instagram right now, because I was never as focused on it as I am right now Mm -hmm. for like my brand in general was never up to par, but like the lessons I learned on like how the business works, if you should open shops, ways different shops run, ways different brands run, how to understand with POS systems, right? Like I got told by somebody to like, just remember how much you're actually paying in fees a year. So when you ask them a question, you don't get blown off. The amount of back end knowledge of like people who have been in the industry for 20, 30, 45 years that you can gain at those shows is ridiculous. It's like, there's so many people that are walking around. You don't necessarily know who's who, or maybe someone who just walked by you is like more important than you thought. You know, oh, way more. So yeah. <laughs> if you have done that work ahead of time of like, oh, I know who that is, you know, then even trying to figure out, oh, I'd love to just say hello, you know, see if I can get a connection here that maybe you can follow up with after the expo. OK, you, t- you mentioned, though, something about you're focusing a little bit more on social media content right now. And, I'm you know, I've noticed like you're definitely putting out more content on YouTube. Like, but can you talk to us about just your social media content you're putting out there and how you're figuring out what your unique voice is in a, you know, industry where there's a lot of, there's a lot of content, right. In barbering. So talk to us about what you've been doing in with social media content. For me, it's kind of, it's kind of like this. So a quick timeline, I wanted to become an educator, blah, 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 blah. And then I opened barbershops, boom. And then at the same time, I'm being an educator and opening barbershops. And then I'm trying to teach my employees how to promote themselves to help me not have to fill their books as much and stuff like that. So instead of me focusing on me, I was focusing on like how to train. Like right now we have almost 30 barbers between our three locations. I was telling them to do what I know works, but I didn't have enough time on the back end to like make myself do it. And now I've kind of gotten to a point where I have a little more flexibility in my schedules that like, I've been really able to like hunker down and study YouTube, right? With YouTube, the amount of footage you have to get for YouTube videos can create thousands of videos on smaller platforms that only allow you a minute. Mm -hmm. So like when it comes to like getting ideas and stuff, I'm really just trying to be me. I hate that people try and stick themselves just to one niche, but I get why it's done that way. So like my niche that I'm stuck in is barbering. I can't avoid that, but I'm also trying to do other things that I enjoy. But I realized that for me to be able to have success with the other things I enjoy, I have to work on this niche for like two years, three years or shorter. You never know. Right. But I have to push out 
mad content on this one niche that people like me for. And then I might be able to trickle them into the other things I'm interested in, like crypto or entrepreneurship or real estate or, and like, I'm just putting out videos based off what I'm doing in my life. Instead of trying to like sit and like create a TV show or like do all that, like I'm literally just going to make videos, but I'm going to be creative in the moment. It's easy to come up with content for things when you're actually doing them. If you want to be known as a national educator, you better be putting out educational videos three times a week. That's where my whole like ideas come from with social media is it's like, okay, I've, I've taken the time to understand how cameras work. I understand what looks good to people. So now it's just not being lazy and actually putting out the content. You slid in just the interest in crypto and NFTs. And it is something that you talk about even on your YouTube channel. And I actually do think you were probably, I think you were, you were the first barber I saw posting about NFTs. And I was honestly like, what is this? Like, what is Ethan posting about? And it piqued my interest because, I mean, knowing after our conversation at the expo, I knew, you know, you meant business. So if you were doing it, I'm like, this boy's doing it. So can you talk to us a little bit just like, how, when did you get into crypto and just that whole world? Because it's obviously mad trending right now. Like yeah. everybody is getting on it. So can you share a little bit more about that? How you got into it? And I mean, also, do you see the like, what is the future of even crypto and barbering, if at all? So there's definitely a future in crypto and barbering. But the way I got into crypto... So like I knew about crypto, but I was just like, oh, I'm just sending someone like some coins and they're redeeming them for money right and then i just kept seeing it pop up i think i really started taking it serious back in 2018 do you remember when your parents were like debit cards are trash cash is king i'm i'm this thing's stupid right so i'm literally hearing history repeat itself in another thing back in 2019 i started day trading forex but i liked crypto because i understood it Mm-hmm. So I forex traded crypto and started like doing research on specific blockchains. Like that's how I ended up getting into like crypto and then I ended up like getting miners because you're printing money. And then now I've developed my own NFT with my friend Nye. He's my he's the co-founder with me on like an that's NFT me. project. For sure. But it's it's on a blockchain that doesn't have an NFT platform like OpenSea yet. So we're like in the pre-release stage of getting in that and what's cool with like nfts in general which an nft is a non-fungible token so like what a lot of people aren't understanding is a non-fungible token basically just makes it so it's on a blockchain if you were to buy an iphone and sell it to someone else and it was through blockchain you would be able to go in and determine when where and why that iphone was bought and then say you hold your iPhone for 10 years and they're like, we're going to do a release package for anybody who owns this specific iPhone. So what you get with that is Apple's going to pay for your stay at a hotel with your family for seven days. And we're going to show you all the things we've been working on with barbering and crypto. I think what's going to end up happening is there's, there's five things that can end up that I know not can will end up happening because I'm definitely going to do one or two of them. Right. And it's so like, you know how like people sell like master classes. Okay. So check this out. You can make that an NFT and you can do a limited run of sales for this master class. And then what that allows you to do is everybody does these subscriptions on the internet for their classes, or they do purchase this for their classes. Right. But by okay. creating a smaller amount and making an NFT contract go to it, they have proof of when they bought it. They have proof of all this, right? So what you're going to be able to do is I'm going to, when I decide in three years to host a business, a business event where I get the biggest people in the industry to basically come out and teach a, teach a business class, not even a barbering class, a business class on how you can blow up the people that bought my NFT of my classes in the past are all going to be able to get free tickets. And then 
I can make the ticket price of it to fill the other seats ridiculous, yeah. right? And then that literally boosts the price of that NFT too. Sure. So like that's like two things. Or you can do like subscriptions for haircuts at your barbershop. Or you could come out with your whole own cryptocurrency that rewards people for coming in to get serviced. You didn't necessarily do something, but you have this just strong determination of like, whether it's like, hey, I'm grabbing the broom, I'm here. I ain't going yeah. anywhere. Like, do you yeah. feel like that mentality really does kind of follow you in whatever venture you're focusing on where it's just this, I'm determined to not only figure this out, but to be great at it. Like, where where does that even come from? Like, in, in your, because not everybody talks like you talk. You know, or yeah. has the confidence to not say, I think this is going to happen, but you're saying, no, it, when it happens, not if, yeah. but when this happens, like you speak with a conviction of like, no, like this, I'm not, I'm not BSing here. Like, this is real. Like, where, do, where does that come from? So no matter what you believe in, whether it's religion or science or energy or the solar systems or whatever, right? What's proven to me, at least, if you want something and you put the energy out there strong enough and you like have the determination to force it to happen it's gonna happen but i feel like a lot of people get lost in the idea of like happiness comes after something for me it's more of just i refuse to be average you only get to live one time i want to be the best at everything i do if I'm alive, that just makes sense to me, right? Like if you want it, you can just yeah. go take that. You can go take that. And I've been that way since I was a kid. I do a lot of research when it comes to like stuff like this. I'm able to like dissect things in my head. And like, yeah. I'm always planning five, six years ahead because I'm in business. Yeah. So like, I think the conviction of it comes from being knowledgeable, but also just being confident enough to do it. Like I'll yeah. do it. If you don't want to do it, I'll do it. That's fine recently in the fall was it Oktoberfest when you did like a pop-up like there was oh, yeah. a tent that you did and then you also did i think i saw marcus posting something about a toyota dealership partnership or something and then yeah. i want to say you posted something about sponsoring a cheerleading team or somebody at savant posted something about a competitive cheerleading team and i have friends that were in competitive cheer i know how big of a world that is and if you're going to nationals like those they're you know, don't mess with those those chair teams. You know, there's a whole Netflix show about cheer. So, yeah. can, I mean, your st some strategic partnerships that you have. Can you talk to us about some of those things you did, whether it's Oktoberfest, this Toyota dealership partnership cheer? Like, how do you maneuver some of these partnerships and what? Yeah. What's the value of them for even Savant? I won't take credit for all the ideas ever. Right. Me and Marcus right. get up at 6 a.m. every morning and go to the gym and spitball ideas. But a lot of it is like, so what a lot of people don't understand is like Instagram and like all this stuff is good. But when you have like a brick and mortar location, it's about the community about around that brick and mortar location. So like not only on Instagram, do we like only specifically target the cities that are around our locations? Like we're not trying to be worldwide right now. Mm -hmm. We're trying to capture the local community. And by doing stuff like that, and like giving back and sponsoring and doing things within the local community, you build a bond with the community that makes you more than just a barber. Because like, like, like sports clips and like super cuts do haircuts. They don't go out of their way to like go specifically do something for that local community yeah. because they don't need to. They've been around too long, yeah. right? So like what people forget is like when you sponsor the cheer team, that's mainly girls, but those girls have dads and brothers and siblings and nieces and nephews. If they see that you're supporting the community, the, the community supports you. So that's why we do a lot of local marketing on top of our, all of our social media marketing is like, I will say in the past month I brought in at the new location, I brought in at least 80 clients off Instagram and the, the account, the new account has less than 400 followers. I brought in 80 people since we opened off Instagram. But what's crazy is what actually fills, like I'm filling books, but what fills that flow within the other 80, grandma being at the cheer team event yeah. 
and seeing it and being like, I'm going to buy three gift cards. And Smart. then three people you don't even know come into the barbershop and that turns into 15. A lot of it's just because we know that if we can be beneficial to the community instead of just take from the community, they're going to give back to us. Or like last year or the year before, there's this thing called grand families. I don't know if that's everywhere, but here it's called grand families. So it's kids whose parents are either in prison, jail, homeless, and they're only taken care of by their grandparents. Their grandparents hold custody. Got it. So like in a day we did 80 free haircuts for kids that were underprivileged. What's crazy is the grandparents started liking us so much that they just kept coming in, giving back to the community, like a little girl who's parents can't afford to get her hair trimmed and like a little trim takes like 20 minutes like i make 150 dollars an hour i can cut a little girl's hair for 15 minutes and people forget that i I love you because yeah the thing you know i had talked about this with um the last guy i interviewed jackson who he has a background in like uh social work and like social and economic development and we were talking about i mean barbershops are about community development or they should be about community development and in that you know the core function of the barbershop is to serve people right it's to serve clients it's to serve so many different types of people and having that that trade having that skill just giving back like you said like you want to give back to your community be a part of the community and it's not like you don't want to do it because it's like oh this is like, sure, of course, it's going to be good for your brand, but that's not the point. Like, the point is like, no, we have this service and we can serve our community with it. We want to be a part of our community. We want to be a good, you know, local business and partnership to the city or whatnot. Like, you want to build a good reputation to where people think of your shop as not just people who are like, you know, the barbers trying to become six figure barbers or whatever, but they're known as barbers who actually care about their city. They care about their community. They give back the byproduct of being genuine or just being a you know serving your community good things will flow out of it you know then the community will the community will take care of you um i want to talk about inspiration just because i think i mean you call yourself on your instagram it's entrepreneur dash you know ethan mortensen and so where yeah where do you get inspiration from like in terms of being an entrepreneur like are there certain people you read or watch or listen to like if someone's listening to this and is like i i really want to learn more about entrepreneurship like i don't know what's your anyone that you would recommend or how does it look like for you where you get inspiration or learn from okay i'm gonna say i'm gonna say one thing before i give my recommendations and it's gonna be controversial all right go for it people aren't gonna like it okay I'm, i'm ready for it okay so If you want to be an entrepreneur, go out and do shit and don't read shit. You reading and not acting on it will not do anything for you, Mm. right? Now, when you're actually doing things, there are people you should look at to help guide you after you've started doing things. But if you don't go out and do things and you're waiting on someone or something to tell you to start doing things, you're already not bred for it. Mm. You're not bred for it. And you might not like that. And that's okay. But they're like, so here's one of the people, Gary, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, right? He says, I give away a hundred percent of my content for free. So 1% of you will actually do something with it. And Mm. as a barbershop owner, I can guarantee you it's actually less than 1%. I am trying to do, what they're trying to do and give people advice like that, right? 1% of people are actually, they're waiting for something or someone to push them over the edge. And like in the entrepreneur world or business in general, the best way I can describe it is you have a parachute. It's fine. It's safe. It's guaranteed to open. And you're at the edge of the cliff. Are you scared to jump? Well, shut that off and jump or put up and shut up. I don't know. Yeah. Like yeah. that's it. That's real. But so some people I watch are Gary V, Ed Milet, Andy Frisella. There's a few more, but those ones are like more hard punching, like go do things. Got you. And I think a lot of people should start there, like change your mindset mm-hmm. before, like don't wait for people. But like at the same time, 
I need a number two. I need a number three. I need a number four. Not everybody can be the number one because there's That's dreamers. Right. There's dreamers, there's doers, and then there's dream doers. So like dream doers are the entrepreneurs, the people that go out, put in work, even if something scares them, they're going to do it, but they can also come up with ideas, right? But then on the other end, there's just dreamers and there's just doers and the dreamers help the dream doers come up with better ideas on top of their ideas. And the doers help enact all the things I can't do by myself. Like I can't run three shops by myself. Yeah. It's impossible. You need like a system and people to help you do that. I hope that's contrary. I hope that calls somebody I out. Like I know that. it called somebody out, but it's so real. I feel, and that's why I do think Barbara is like, we all have a piece of entrepreneurship in us, obviously, but also something that you say, we're like, you just got to start doing shit. Like, it's like someone who's saying about getting a barbering and they're just on YouTube watching like hours and hours and hours of tutorials and they're like, Oh, have you cut hair yet? No, stop watching. Just go cut. Go give a haircut. You need you a know? thousand reps before you even <laughs> understand what that guy's doing. Exactly. Like that's and I think that's what barbers are like at some point in time, you had to take the leap and give the skin fade, you know, or take the leap and give the lineup or take the leap and do the haircut that you've never done before. And instead of being like, yo, can you show me how to do this? I've never, you know, <laughs> etc. you know. All of it. Like, I've never used thinning shears before, or I don't know. Like, okay, well, just grab them and just start and figure it out. You figure it out as you go. You know, you're not doing anybody any good by just, like, opening the lever up and down with <laughs> figuring out what guards you want to use. And so I feel like that's what you said is should land easily for barbers because the origin story, I think everyone will resonate with that moment of a client sits in your chair and is like i want this haircut and you're kind of like i don't know if i've ever given this before but i mean you fake it till you make it you know you just just do it just yeah do it. freaking do it man freaking do it. <laughs> and grab the barber that knows how to do it if you mess it up exactly. don't be the dude in the gym acting like he's a pro ba a pro basketball player be the teenager becoming a pro basketball player Man, so much good stuff. Okay, let's. We're gonna wrap up with some final thoughts. I mean, yeah, we pushed a little longer than I thought, but that's okay. I might. There's just such. I mean, it's, we could talk for another hour, honestly. But oh, let's yeah. do some final thoughts. So the name of this this podcast is Beyond Barber School, empowering barbers to take a courageous next step in their journey. I mean, you've already given us a ton of wisdom. But any final thoughts to share, like with anybody who's listening? They could be barber students. They could be licensed barbers for decades, or maybe they're just starting out their career, or I don't know. Any any final thoughts just to share with the community? Welcome to welcome to barbering and the business game. And you can do this. Don't be scared. Put in the work, and don't be lazy. That's all, all right, I got. Ethan, where where can people where can uh, our listeners follow you? Where can they find you uh, on social if they wanted to engage more with you? So um, on YouTube, it's Ethan Mortensen. Um, on Instagram, it's Life of Savant. On Twitter, it's the NFT Hokage because I started uh, my own NFT and crypto project with my friend. And okay. then other than that, DM me if you need more info. Thanks so much for, for being here. Appreciate your time. I know you're busy, a busy guy. So, um, yeah, you already heard what he said. Go follow him on all of his uh, channels and make sure you, yes, if whatever he's doing, you better pay attention. All right. Thanks for being here, Ethan. We appreciate it. Catch you later. Peace. Peace.